So today, Ashley will be talking about the establishment of the La Labrador campus. Um, and this is something that is very near and dear to me, to my heart, both personally and professionally. I grew up in a small community in Northern Labrador where dreams of attending university meant knowing that I would have to travel um, outside and leave Labrador. Um, now, I left home with my mother when she went back to university to get her education degree at Memorial. Um, I was in grade five at the time and did uh, three years of grade school in St. John's. Um, it was an adjustment, but years later, um, I realized that it was an experience that gave me a bit of an advantage to when I eventually came to Memorial to do my um, undergraduate degree, having had that experience of living in St. John's. However, most people don't have um, that kind of experience. So the geography part of attending university is one thing, and having a university campus in Labrador will address some of those issues. And that is just really, really so exciting. Um, so as many of you know, in January 2022 this year, Memorial announced the historic creation of the Labrador campus. And it is just thrilling and super exciting. And um, Ashley has been um, pivotal in, in making that happen. But what's as exciting as having a campus in Labrador and perhaps more exciting is the opportunity to create new kinds of programs. Um, and that's something Ashley has been working tirelessly on um, in partnership with the three indigenous groups and diverse partners in Labrador, the Labrador campus and the School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies have a mission and vision to develop new place-based, Northern-focused and Indigenous-led undergraduate, graduate and postgraduate programs, governance structures, research initiatives, and campus infrastructure that will be responsive to the needs and priorities of Labrador and the North. So when we talk about teaching for change, this to me is exactly what this is all about. So in Ashley's presentation, she will discuss the evolution of the Labrador campus, the unique pedagogical foundations and principles of the emerging curriculum and programming, and the innovative governance structures, which provide the three indigenous governments in Labrador with direct input on all academic research and education matters of the School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies and the Labrador campus. And this is just, it's groundbreaking. Um, and I will be really um, transformational for the Labrador campus, but for us as a university as well, seeing how we can look at different types of governance structures. Um, based on the uh, um, briefing. Um, she'll also be looking at ways in which policies, processes, and structures can be mobilized to open new, indigenized, and northernized spaces in university settings where diverse knowledge systems and learners are welcomed and can thrive and flourish. Um, spaces where people can truly be in their element. And for anyone interested in some readings relevant uh, to the presentation. There are res resources that she's provided and they're available on the conference website. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ashley Consolo. Um, Ashley is the founding and interim dean of the School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies and the new Labrador campus of Memorial University. Together with partners in Labrador, Ashley is leading the development of a Northern focused and indigenous led undergraduate, graduate and postgraduate programs, expanding research that is directly responsive to and meets the needs and priorities of Indigenous and Northern communities, growing the Pi Center for Northern Boreal Food Systems, a research, education, and community farm focused on Northern food security and food sovereignty, and developing new campus infrastructure in Labrador. As a leader, Ashley focuses on institution building, decolonization, indigenization, 
and EDIAR, and Northern Sovereignty in Research and Education. A former Canada Research Chair and a member emeritus of the Royal Society of Canada College of New Artists, Scholars, and Scientists, Ashley is also a leading researcher, author, and media commentator on climate change, mental health, and ecological grief. And it, I just would like to say it's been a real pleasure and honor working alongside Ashley over the past five or six years, and I feel very fortunate that we have such an engaged and visionary leader at the helm of this important work. Over to you, Ashley. So I just lost internet connection. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure Catherine just wrapped up because you just popped in and I can see you nodding. Yes. Um, but I just switched over. Connection. Hopefully that's more stable, but that actually is a is a funny foreshadow for what we're going to be talking today that uh, that I had a technical glitch. But Catherine, I, I caught uh, right up until probably the last 30 seconds. So <laughs> thank you very much for the, the generous introduction. And in particular, thank you for being such a key part of the creation and the movement towards the Labrador campus right from the very beginning. And certainly your uh, leadership, your advocacy, your lived experience really has made this uh, possible and working with so many people that we've been lucky enough to work with um, together to see this dream come to a reality. And thank you so much to Kim and Gavin and all the organizers. Uh, you know, it's it's really exciting to be here and, and actually talk about this from a different perspective. I know a number of you on the calls have seen various presentations and things that we've done, but this one's going to dig in a little more to the personal pieces, um, the pedagogical pieces, the overall, you know, the politics, the ethics of why we're doing this and what it actually means um, and, and dig into the human element about the purpose of the campus and what teaching for change, what structures for change, what learning for change can actually do and, and be if we envision diverse new futures um, within post-secondary education. So I'm gonna get my screen up and sharing, um, but it's, it's you know, we're, we're gonna have a dialogue throughout. There's lots of places where I would love to hear um, from your experiences and uh, just different places that, that, that you've all experienced. Um, the, the focus on this is about being in your element. And this is a key theme that we're gonna talk about throughout the whole presentation. But the first piece, before we get into being in our element is actually to talk about the the elements on which I'm currently situated as a guest uh, and on which the Labrador campus of Memorial University is situated. And, you know, I've been reflecting on what Dr. Mullen said this morning about the importance of not uh, tuning out or not sort of letting our mind wander when we're talking about land acknowledgements. And for us at the Labrador campus, uh, these are more than land acknowledgements. It's actually our commitment to relationships and our commitment to working uh, with the three Indigenous governments of Labrador on Inuit and Inu homelands as an institution of higher education and looking what our shared responsibility really is uh, for responding to the land, for responding to people, to cultures, to histories, um, and what that means for self-determination. And what it means as individuals who work at the Labrador campus, but also as an institution of post-secondary education, what that means um, in an age of, of reconciliation, but also the opportunities that we have if we take these commitments um, to being guests on other people's lands and what that what we can actually do if we start to work together. So the first thing I want to ask everyone is what does being in your element mean to you? And where are the places that you feel most in your element? If you can drop it in the chat, um, I can, can see the chat window as well. But I'd love to hear from you about, like, what does this mean to you? And when you hear that phrase in your element or that someone's in their element, uh, what does it mean and what do you, what do you think of?
And actually, Kim, I may not be. Oh, no, they're starting to pop in now. I was a little worried my uh, <laughs> my Wi-Fi wasn't going to allow it. Yeah, so comfortable. I mean, that's oh, coming up. Great. Being true and being true. who you were. Yeah. Yeah, I love that one. Familiar. Yeah. Yeah, Good. and engaged. Yes, thank you, Fleur. That's comfortable and engaged. Um, and comfort is where people flourish. Feeling confident. Oh, Erica, I also like your play on words there about as a chemist and the in your elements connection there as well. Yeah. 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 Ability to thrive, secure. Yeah. Oh, I like uh, where comfort meets challenge. Uh, mm. Feeling in the flow. Oh, thank you. These are great. I, uh, I'm really appreciating them popping up as they go by. So where do you feel most in your element? At my cabin with family. Yep, these are great. Community. Kim, jump in too if I have a leg uh, on the land yeah. by the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Outside near water. Yeah. Multiple places, engaged in the classroom, all alone in the wilderness. Interesting. That's always the one I find pops up is, you know, the ocean, nature, camping, mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle, nice to see you with my family in Labrador. <laughs> mm. yeah. Connection to the land always makes us feel in our element, isn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Gardening. Yeah. Yeah. These are all wonderful. And uh, I think what we're seeing is these, these common themes, as Kim just said, you know, being outside, being on the land, being in nature, connecting to community and family. Uh, and and in a place where you feel comfortable uh, and you feel challenged, but it feels familiar. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that these things have come up because this at the core is what drives uh, the Labrador campus and what we're doing. And so when you when you look at the definitions of being in your element, it's doing something you enjoy or you do well, that you're happy and comfortable in a situation. So we've seen that come up. And that you really uh, feel in your preferred environment where you feel confident and at ease. And when we think about environment, it's not just the physical environment, but it's the broader sociocultural connection. It's the broader natural environment. So it's not just our built infrastructure and what we've done as, as institutions of post-secondary learning, but it's also what people bring from outside of the classroom in and vice versa. And so I want to carry this theme of being in your element and what that actually means if we're going to create spaces and places where people um, have the opportunity to, to learn and gain a university education while feeling in their element, confident, uh, happy, surrounded by family and friends, and in a place that reflects who they are and who they want to be and where they want to be. Okay, so another question for you. Does anyone know how many universities, approximately, it doesn't have to be an exact number, are uh, in Canada? Mm. That's my first question, just uh, general, general guesses. Brian, this is a, an incredibly specific and very accurate number. <laughs> so. 96, yeah. 15, yeah. 97. Yeah, it, it seems to be... Uh, depending on how definitions go, anywhere from like a 96, 97 to just over 100. Um, so we'll say, you know, approximately 100 universities throughout Canada. How many universities are in the north in Canada? Mm. A what, 10? One? Yeah. One, and, five. Uh, the one is correct, and bonus points if people can name it and when it was established. Okay. Uh, yep, UConn University, yeah. and it was actually uh, in 2020. It's been almost two years now for, for UConn. 
Um, and that is a very, very telling thing yeah. for generations. Uh, up until 2020, there was no option for students living in the North uh, to get a post-secondary education through a university up until 2020. And that has created historic inequities in access to education and generational inequities. Um, what is also really important to think about is simultaneously um, there was a focus by uh, provinces that have northern regions such as Newfoundland and Labrador and by territories to establish college programs and vocational programs which uh, at the beginning were focused often on getting people in the north into training for resource extraction done by southern companies in the north to then support southern um, interests and needs. So there's been a long history of using, quite frankly, in uh, northern bodies and northern peoples for resource extraction and providing uh, that type of education only and, and discouraging people from taking other forms of education or to following other dreams and aspirations that they may have. And again, it's, it's not only a lack of access physically, but it was the systems that were put in place to make sure that people um, weren't often pursuing a university education. And there's actually in many cases, um, because the discussion of university education in the North is not new, um, there has been a lot of pressure to not um, give people access to universities in the North. And that's changing, thank goodness. <clears throat> so what we're seeing across the North right now, there's an incredible vibrant network of northern post-secondary education institutions, colleges, and now UConn University. And these, um, these institutions are really changing an understanding of what northern education is, uh, what northern sovereignty over education looks like, and changing up how we understand how curriculum can be offered. And all of them are really focused on being responsive to place and being embedded in place and being committed specifically to Northern people's cultures and places while providing high quality university and, and college education. And for all, um, or for the majority of the Northern institutions right now, they are all moving through various forms of transitioning into uh, being universities. So within the next few years, we should see um, every territory and um, us here in Labrador with university offerings for the first time that is specifically led by the North and for the North. And when we're looking at, at what people have access to, you know, these, these Northern institutions are providing life-changing education and research opportunities and supporting Northern sovereignty in terms of providing people an opportunity to actually dream and aspire. But there's still you know, vast inequities in access. Uh, so we still only have one university in the North and now we have um, us as a Southern university with a Northern campus. And people still have to travel um, often vast distances um, and, and in many cases face incredible systemic barriers to leaving particularly uh, northern and, and remote communities and coming to southern places to achieve a post-secondary education. And for many students, those barriers are very difficult, um, very traumatic, very painful, and at times insurmountable, uh, and people make the choice to move back home because of, of those barriers. And that means that for generations, we have lost a tremendous amount of people um, from post-secondary or from university education systems throughout the country, um, people who are incredible leaders, incredible thinkers, and yet because of the barriers that are in place and the lack of access, haven't had the same opportunities that others have had. So this is really kind of what has, has led to the, the impetus for and the underpinnings of the Labrador campus. But I really wanna emphasize this is not a new discussion. Uh, so for over 60 years, Memorial has had a presence in Labrador for part-time. And then over 42 years, it was a full-time presence through the Labrador Institute. Uh, this presence, while really important and while having a mandate to specifically work with communities in Labrador and make the connections between Labrador and the university, 
uh, had a lot of limitations. It was an administrative unit only. Uh, it didn't have academic access. It couldn't offer degrees. Um, we had faculty who were working in Labrador who have done amazing work, but they were always appointed to other units um, throughout Memorial, and so they weren't appointed to us. Uh, and there's been a lot of barriers to what we could actually do. So while there was some wonderful, successful programs, most recently the Inuit Bachelor of Education cohort program in partnership uh, with the Faculty of Education and the Nunatsuvik government, and right before that, the Inuit Bachelor of Social Work program with obviously the, the uh, social work and the Nunatsuvik government, uh, there were limitations to actually being able to support students. So often what the Labrador Institute became was a way for students to connect with Memorial, but they would always still have to leave to achieve their, their university goals. So, you know, we have a 42-year full-time presence and then four years of working through uh, a really amazing task force that functioned for um, two years, almost two years, um, that had representatives from all throughout Memorial University, as well as community leaders, uh, and of course, the three Indigenous governments here, and worked to really think about what is the future of university, uh, Memorial University in Labrador, but more importantly, what are the responsibilities and obligations? Uh, what does it actually mean if a campus was going to come to fruition? What would it look like? Where are we right now um, you know, in this, this post-truth and reconciliation time? What, what would it look like to work differently and create a different form of campus governance and, of course, different forms of curriculum? So there was you know, hundreds of, of meetings, discussions, consultations, feedback over many years, and also noting that for decades, people have been advocating for a university campus in Labrador. And so we're building on uh, many, many dreams, many aspirations, many desires, and many people who have worked tirelessly to advocate for this. And then to get here, there were five historic Senate and Board of Regents votes. Um, so it's quite a lengthy process to go through, but we are absolutely delighted, as, as Catherine shared at the beginning, that in 20, uh, January 2022, we officially became the Labrador campus of Memorial University. And that has been a historic shift here. You know, that has um, changed everything. It is a major topic of conversation here. Uh, every time I go to the grocery store or you know, to the pharmacy, this is what people wanna talk about. They are so excited. Um, and what's really amazing is people feel a tremendous ownership over it. People, um, some people have been calling it the people's campus. Uh, some people get very emotional when talking about it. In those meetings that we had and in the years of work, you know, the, the, the human element and the emotional element of what it actually means to people to have access to university education cannot be underscored. We had lots of people um, express a lot of pain and trauma in meetings, but also a lot of hope, a lot of optimism. A lot of people talked about the healing that will happen here, um, that the generational inequities that have happened, uh, will that a university education can actually contribute to healing and flourishing. We have a lot of people talking about um, the linkages between universities and ongoing colonization and residential schools and what this will mean. Um, people talking about not having to say goodbye to their families to achieve education, uh, being able to walk into a place where they, they feel heard and seen. So this is about more than just getting degrees or diplomas or certificates. This is about people feeling valued uh, fundamentally for who they are and what they bring. And one of the things that is so important to us is the shared governance structure. And Catherine mentioned this at the beginning. So we have the, the first academic council um, of Memorial University and one of the first in the country that has voting membership for the three indigenous governments. And this also means not only voting membership, but that quorum can never be reached for any um, decision or vote without all three indigenous representatives being there and voting. Uh, and if they're unable to be there, we go through other processes. But that means that moving forward um, and, and you know, for this, this structure, people from outside of the university have opportunities to lead and contribute and shape curriculum, academic decisions, research, and how we're going to shape the overall governance moving forward. And this has been, been 
a, a complete sort of change for what we can do and what it actually enables us to do is remarkable. So the work of this academic council has moved us forward in such tremendous ways that we would not have been able to do on our own. And it also means that these academic decisions that we're making are reflective of Inu and Inuit needs and priorities and really focus on strengthening the relationships and the commitments that we have. And then it continues to hold us as the university in relationship, but importantly in structures of accountability. And the creation of structures is so important because then it is not dependent on who is in any one position or individual relationships. It's putting relationships um, institution to institution, or in this case, institution to the government to government to government to make sure that this is a lasting legacy and structure. So I really want to sort of switch here and talk about some of the curriculum focus and the, the learning from the land piece that we're looking at. And this is one of my, if you, if you haven't read this book, A Third University is Possible, I highly recommend it. Um, it really helped to frame and give language to what we're trying to do in Labrador. And this opening line here about within the colonizing university also exists a decolonizing education. Uh, and that is what we're trying to do. You know, we understand uh, the history of universities in Canada are ones of colonization. They were structured for that purpose and they still maintain as, as institutions of colonial history and heritage and continue to perpetuate colonial mandates and privileges. But that doesn't mean that there isn't opportunities and space within them for decolonizing education. And I love the way that this is framed where, you know, occupying the same time and space are also Indigenous land and life before and beyond occupation. And this is something we talk about a lot. We talked about through the, the task force we talk about in our uh, academic council is that, you know, our presence on Indigenous lands means that we are simultaneously dealing with and connected to the Indigenous land and life before what it is now and where it will be beyond occupation as we change. And that is an incredible responsibility that we carry. And this idea of the regeneration of relations and the forwarding of Indigenous and Black and queer futures is something that is, is at the core of what we're looking to do. And, you know, it's not to say that it's it's easy <laughs> to find this, this third university, as La Pepperson um, calls it. it. It is incredibly tough and it is incredibly difficult to find it. But when you look through what we actually do, the spaces that we have, the things that we can do as educators, as academic leaders of people who have the ability to make change, these spaces exist. And it's actually our responsibility to find them and grow them and look at this regeneration of relationships to forward other futures. So the elements of, of design, when we're really thinking about it, is all about co-developing place-based Northern focus and Indigenous-led curriculum and programs. And this is with our academic council, um, but this is of course with many diverse uh, rights holders and partners throughout Labrador and also throughout the North. Um, you know, with Memorial's really amazing generational relationship with Nunavut Art at College, there's a lot of opportunity for North to North connections there. And we're building and strengthening relationships with the other Northern post-secondary institutions across the country so that we can actually go North to North to North rather than looking North to South or South to North. We also take the, the responsibility that education at its heart really can be healing and flourishing. Yes, it is absolutely for our minds. Uh, you know, we intellectual curiosity and growth is essential, but it is also about healing and it is also about flourishing, about how we can support and recognize um, what has happened here in Labrador, what a history of colonization and residential schools and forced relocation has done, and what a lack of access to university education has, has created through educational inequity and what this can, can do to contribute to healing and flourishing. We also believe that it needs to be reciprocal and responsive, and of course, reflective of lands, waters, and cultures. That is, is essential so that people feel in their element. 
And, you know, one of the things that came up a lot over the years of our of our work and our consultations was people saying over and over again, they never felt they had the space or they were encouraged to dream or aspire for their futures. Um, they felt the options were limited. Uh, they felt they weren't encouraged to pursue uh, university education. And if they were, it was often in sort of very limited places. And so the idea that we need to open up spaces where people can dream and aspire the futures that they want, the self-determined futures, the futures of justice, and the futures of, of the North and Northern um, sovereignty. So, you know, I, I uh, also long fan of, of Parker Palmer, and I have always loved this quote about, you know, we don't think our way into a new kind of living. We live our way into a new kind of thinking. And I have to remind myself of this because I do a lot of thinking all the time and I can get trapped in my head. Uh, and this is something that we talk about uh, a lot in the work that we're doing is, you know, it's one thing that we sit down as faculty, as staff of members of the academic council, and we're trying to think of how we create new structures. We get stuck in the administration. We get stuck in the daily bus busyness. But we have to remember that it's really about living our way into a new kind of thinking and that students who will come to the campus and experience the curriculum, the embodiment of what they will be doing will be creating that new kind of thinking and will be growing the structures and will be pushing us to change and that we have to continually grow and change as we're becoming this new campus because we need uh, everyone to live our way into a new kind of thinking. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that it's going to be comfortable, but it has to be where we go now. We, we can't replicate the status quo. We can't um, get stuck in the, this is how things have been done, or this is what a university should be or shouldn't be. We need to start embodying this and living our way into a new kind of post-secondary education. So where we're at right now um, is in fall 2022, we're moving into two exciting partnerships, uh, offering nursing for uh, the first time as, as a four-year degree starting in fall 2022, and also engineering one. And, you know, this is really exciting that other units throughout Memorial are looking to us and are offering these programs here because, you know, I, the particularly for nursing right now, all the acceptances are going out and we are seeing people um, post on social media, these amazing testimonies to how excited they are to have gotten in um, and, and specifically saying, I would never have been able to do this if it wasn't in Labrador. And the number of people who are identifying this as a lifelong dream or a life-changing experience. And then the, the hundreds of comments that are coming in from, from people and communities congratulating them, saying they're so proud, like this is amazing. This is why we're here, you know, and, and this is just the start of where we're going and what that will mean for people to be able to pursue a whole diversity of degrees and diplomas and certificates and to actually be able to, to create their own futures and be able to do it right here at home. So our plans for 2023, again, these are all, uh, they're all tentative because as everyone knows, creating new programs takes some time and there's, there's many, many uh, pieces to it. But we're moving through the process of a graduate program in Arctic and Subarctic Futures, uh, which is interdisciplinary and also has some really neat land-based and seasonal components to it. Uh, and that would have multiple pathways. So people have really asked for flexibility and modular learning. Um, so it, the, the graduate program itself would have diploma options, master's options, and uh, a PhD's options. So we're hoping that will launch um, in 2023, but again, we'll see how, how processes and approvals go. And then also in 2023 and beyond, um, we're looking at a diploma in Northern Indigenous Child and Youth Care. And this has come out um, directly from requests from the Indigenous governments here who are moving through processes of the devolution of the child welfare and child care programs to the governments themselves. Um, I'm sure you've all been seeing in the news that the different um, child inquiries have been, have been starting. And we're looking at the creation of a full interdisciplinary undergraduate program, which will really be the anchor program of the campus. 
And this is, is going to look, we're hoping, quite different. So we're talking through some different options about having a lot of time on the land, having module learning instead of discrete courses, looking at interdisciplinary synthesis and having um, elders, um, knowledge holders, experts in the field integrated throughout, as well as the core faculty members that will be guiding students through these programs. And we're also excited and, and really open to other partnered opportunities. Um, you know, there are a lot of requests that um, people have here for access to education. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for other units at Memorial to look at offering diplomas, degrees, or full, um, or diplomas, certificates, and full degrees here in Labrador and having cohort programs. And we've seen tremendous success from that in the past. Uh, and I know that that will be very successful in the future. Uh, and also, we have a ton of requests for micro-credentials and professional development in a whole variety of areas focused on northern leadership, um, land claims negotiations, Indigenous conservation and protected areas, um, Indigenous and northern leadership, all pieces that people are looking for. And that's not only requests from Labrador, but also we've been talking to um, you know, other governments and institutions across the north about what are some of the key training opportunities that, that we have that we could provide. So these are kind of where we're going. You know, it, it does take a long time and we are um, working in quite large partnerships and relationships, but we're really excited about the potential and what the future is going to bring here. So I'm gonna, gonna take a break here and I'd like to ask everyone, when you think about uh, what university education could be, um, in in Labrador, what are some things that you've been thinking about, not only for this presentation, but before, like when you heard about the campus or when you've heard various presentations or discussions, what do you think it, it could be? What are the opportunities that we have here? Engaged with and driven by community priorities, which you've already identified. Yeah, thank you, Brady. Yep, absolutely. That's a great opportunity we have here. Yeah, from against. the land and elders. Yep. Indigenized models of learning. Mm. Yeah, Melissa, thank you for flagging that because that's something that I, yeah. I want to talk about um, as we we finish up here. Yeah, and Kellyanne, thank you. Because I think, um, you know, sometimes, and particularly in the discussions leading up to the creation of the Labrador campus, a lot of the um, discussions we were having, often people would focus on what memorial as a whole could quote unquote teach Labrador. And we've always tried to flip it to say, actually, Labrador can teach memorial a lot and other universities a lot. And um, and Erica, I don't think that's extractive because that's what we're hoping is how to rethink governance. Uh, and because there are things that happen differently in the North, uh, and there are different ways of thinking and being and knowing and doing. So I, I think you know there's a lot that Memorial is going to to support us here, and there's a lot that we're going to be able to inform Memorial. And so I think that's the exciting place that, that we're in and that the sky really is the limit. And it's not just the limit for students and learners who will come through that door. And in particular, you know, people coming out of high school, but we have a whole slew of adult learners who are constantly asking when programs are going to start because they would love to have a university education and they've never had that access before. So we're really looking forward to intergenerational classrooms and, and what that will mean. And I think, uh, you know, that that connection as, as is coming up, not only through universities, but also across the north um, and what that means and then what that can show the university and bring and how we can all be enriched. So the sky is the limit uh, for students, for learning, for institutional structures, and we're really just at the beginning. And so I want to share a couple of quotes uh, from the from President Johannes Lamp of Nunatsivit where you know he's talking about geography has always been a barrier and sometimes students just cannot physically leave home and we have heard this time and time again 
that it's not that people don't want to go to university. It's not that they're, you know, not capable or they don't have the background. Sometimes there are just other reasons that people physically can't leave. And we need to be able to support people in place where they are. For Grand Chief Etienne Rich, you know, he talks about the important pathway for young people to continue their education close to home where they have community and family support. This is part of being in your element where you can be in a place where you have your community and family and cultural support and you can follow your dreams for university education. For President Todd Russell, um, it's fundamental to reconciliation and providing an opportunity where we can actually look at how research and education can benefit communities across Labrador. And one of the things that has been really uh, incredible when we talk to potential students of all ages who might be interested in the Labrador campus, when they would talk about why they wanted to achieve a university education, for many, it was not only for themselves and their own interests, but it was to support their communities and support the North. And the number of people who talked about, you know, uh, doing this as an act of service to the land, to their cultures, to their communities, to the Indigenous governments, so that they could become strong leaders uh, and make a change and become, you know, the, the, the future of self-determination in the North is a huge motivating factor for many people who have identified wanting to, to have this opportunity in Labrador. So I want to pause here because, you know, the conference is about teaching for change, and I 100% agree with that. We need transformative education, and teaching in the classrooms is a major way that we can alter uh, people's lives. We can create those transformative learning opportunities, and we can impact society and, and communities. But what are the other things that we also need to change simultaneously to support our ability to teach for change and to support our ability in the classroom? And I would love to hear from everyone what you think are the other pieces that go hand in hand with teaching for change. I know many of you on the call have a list of things that uh, <laughs> that need to to be disrupted or or uh, altered or changed. Yeah. Openness to diversity. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah. Revisiting workload, workload for sure. Assessment methods. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, on on our end, all of those things and also the structures, yeah, the decolonizing approaches to curriculum and leadership, absolutely. Uh, university dependence on timetabling. Yes, this is a huge thing that we're dealing with for how we're trying to re-envision an undergraduate education. Um, within these sort of, in many cases, um, structures of a semester that don't actually align with the seasonal shifts and with the times that people actually want breaks to be out on the land or to do things that are culturally important. So how do we create space in a semester system, in an undergraduate program to reflect, um, you know, the key fishing times or berry picking times or the times in Labrador where, you know, being out on the land is essential to your overall well-being. And so I think what we also need if we want to teach for change is simultaneously we need structural change and that's structural change at all levels. Um, you know, people will often say to, to us, you know, they'll ask us like, what's the biggest challenge of creating the Labrador campus? And we have two big challenges. Uh, one is other people's perception of Labrador um, and of, of Labrador's um, quote unquote readiness to have a university. Uh, which is based on a lot of systemic, uh, oppressive, racialized, colonial thinking. Um, and the other one is we're actually our own biggest barrier as a university because the structures that we have in place are, as if you think back to that um, quote from a third university, they're still a colonizing university. 
And so finding the spaces within that for the decolonizing education is incredibly challenging. And actually creating this, um, even though the support for this is enormous, when it actually comes to the structures, it's incredibly challenging because at every turn, there's a structure that doesn't quite fit or a policy that doesn't quite work. So we need to teach for change. We need to learn for change. We need to embody our ways into new thinking and we need serious structural change. And part of that serious structural change is allowing um, systems to learn from each other. So as we're learning from the rest of the Memorial University system to develop a campus in Labrador, to simultaneously have the university system writ large learn from Labrador and learn from the other Northern post-secondary education. So I, I wanna end here. This is Elder and Dr. Jean Crane. She received her honorary doctorates from Memorial University. And Jean was the elder on our, our task force, um, but she is so much more than that. Jean is a, a residential school survivor who has done tremendous um, advocacy for Indigenous and Northern rights for her whole life, particularly around the themes of women's rights and safety, uh, youth and education. And in 1979, Jean joined Memorial University's Board of Regents uh, as a Labrador representative. And one of the things that she advocated for at every meeting tirelessly was the creation of a Labrador campus. Because in 1979 and for the time that she served, she and others here in Labrador who joined her saw the campus as a way to undo injustice, as a way to support families and children, as a way to heal from the legacies of residential school systems and ongoing oppression and as a way to create stronger communities and a stronger region. So I want you to think about that. This is 1979, Jean was advocating for this on the Board of Regents. And then uh, Jean was there for um, being on the task force that led to the creation and was there for the announcement and received an honorary doctorate from Memorial University for the work um, that she did. A lifetime of work and a lifetime of so many people that have led to this. And the responsibility that we carry as a university, that I carry, that faculty and staff here carry, this is what we think about, um, about coming in full circle, the stranger in the ancient races, healing now so that our hearts beat strong and the spirits sing and that people can come and they can come to the Labrador campus and that this is what they experience through their university education and that they can truly be in their element. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I would love to have a discussion around all of this um, about what it means, where our responsibilities are, how we can think about university education um, differently and what we can learn from the North and how we can be open in our own teaching and structures to actually allow this, this learning to inform us. Uh, uh, Ashley, Catherine Pendankis in uh, the chat, she remarks a challenge. How to ensure access to post-secondary education without subjecting young people in the North to student debt? Yes. Yes, this is something uh, that we've absolutely been talking about. Um, and uh, the, the three Indigenous governments here have various ways to support their students who are members or beneficiaries and um, are working on, on other ways as well. But we have also been talking a lot about doing um, substantial sort of donor relations and fundraising to see if we can support um, and, and sponsor students because it, it is, I mean, it's an issue everywhere, um, but particularly in places like Labrador and other Northern and remote areas, um, you know, we wanna support students to come in and be successful but also not to then carry that, that heavy student debt. So access financially, you know, we talk a lot about access through curriculum or by being in a place where you feel in your element, but also there is a financial element. Um, and, you know, I think we have a lot of support and opportunities 
here to do that. Um, and we, we do have people who are interested and who have been reaching out about how can they support students once our programs are up and running to actually um, financially be able to afford coming in. Thanks for those uh, kind words, Catherine, and thanks for all you you have done for all of this for so many years and all the advocating that you have done for Labrador uh, even before starting at Memorial University and, of course, in your position at Memorial. Yes, Brian, I uh, agree. It's It's the removing of barriers. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the things that need to happen uh, at universities to make change. Um, and we're also, we, we often frame it as we need to have more um, like Indigenous focused curriculum or we need to have more Indigenous faculty, which we absolutely do. We 100% need that. Um, and, and in particular, Memorial really needs that. But we also need to remove barriers. So it's not just about adding, it's about subtracting and it's about removing the things that have made those inequities in the first place. So those mechanisms of oppression and colonization that have been put in place by universities, we need to simultaneously add and subtract. We need to, to work that out and look at what it means from not only an indigenization and decolonization lens, but an anti-racism lens. And, you know, that's one of the things from that quote from the third university is looking at, you know, the indigenous, black, queer, diverse, just futures. Um, we, we need to do that. And that means both adding and subtracting within the university system. Hmm. We do too, Michelle. We're very excited about Engineering One coming to to Labrador. That's going to be a, a transformative experience for people here. Yeah, Melissa, I'm just reading uh, your piece now. Um, this this actually comes up a lot as well, and and the ideas around food sovereignty and food security and food systems is something that people request a lot to see um, in in curriculum, but also through uh, the Pi Center for Northern Boreal Food Systems, which is our farm here, which is a research education and community farm. And the requests for traditional cooking, um, for harvesting and preserving foods. And we're doing a lot of wellness programs right now um, with uh, Jordan's principal in Sheshashit First Nations, as well as with the Nunatsuvit government, the Nunatsuvit Community Council, um, and developing relationships with Labrador Grenfell Health to actually do traditional healing programs on the farm uh, and what that might look like and how we can support mental health and addictions and um, transition living and people with uh, neurodiversities and youth and all different ways so that we can actually bring people together through food and through family and through community and also how we can integrate that into um, curriculum and so this is actually a discussion we're having right now for our undergraduate program is how do we bring these kind of pieces within the undergraduate experience as well. And of course, we're hoping our graduate program will actually have people researching um, what you've been putting up there because that's a huge need and desire here. Yeah, Jim, thank you for flagging um, the impact of intergenerational trauma and, and uh, the trauma informed curriculum discussion is very, very important. And as I um, was talking about healing, is a lot of people were talking about education, not only as a form of healing, but a form of survival and a form of, of rectifying past wrongs and, and a way to start to feel um, whole and valued and respected. And so that that's actually something, and we're looking at various supports. So we're looking at having a campus elder program um, where there's elders on campus at all times, having an indigenous uh, counselor and social worker, where they're actually not only there to, to support students, but actually be in the classroom and, and be in curriculum. So yeah, absolutely.
Uh, so Erica, thanks for asking about the engineering one. Um, we are in the process of um, hoping to launch this fall uh, and students did have the opportunity to enter in through the Labrador campus. And we are um, looking at the program in different ways to reflect the North and to reflect Labrador and particularly to um, have curriculum uh, and, and examples of engineering practices and principles reflect Labrador. Uh, and also, we're just at the beginning stages of looking to put together a certificate for people who finish the program that would also have the inclusion of really exciting new courses on Indigenous um, engineering and looking at climate change engineering and what that means from a community perspective and what community engaged and community led engineering actually looks like. Um, so there's there's discussions on the way there, and we're really excited about that. People have really wanted um, an engineering program in Labrador for a long time because there's so much resource extraction and development programs here, uh, and the engineers are generally always from away, uh, and people see this. Um, there's there's often a hierarchy on the job sites where you know the the engineers are are from elsewhere, and people want Labrador engineers very much to be leading Labrador projects and to be integrating Indigenous knowledge into engineering because there's a tremendous amount of Indigenous engineering knowledge here that, that is left out in the mainstream system. Actually, Kim here, I'm just going to, uh, I'd like to ask a question because we're doing some work with you, obviously, around the technology by how we're delivering these programs and stuff. So. Just curious, like, you know, uh, when we talk about the importance of the place and the people and being in your element and so much of this will be delivered through technology, you know, bringing it's kind of cool what what we're doing, um, you know, bringing different groups across the province together in different programs and at different sites as well as in Labrador. How does the technology um, you know, how do you how do you marry those two together and, and how are people receiving that in, in the Labrador uh, campus around how the technology is integrated into into the indigenous, you know, curriculum and, and programming? Yeah, that's uh, they are ever evolving ongoing discussions um, because of the limitations sometimes. Well, as you saw, I lost Internet. And I'm in Goose Bay, uh, so I lost internet right before this presentation, and this happens for students all up and down the coast. Um, so we're, and people want accessibility. So it was very clear in the creation and the, the decisions around the Labrador campus that in-person was really, really desirable, but so was um, hybrid opportunities where it could be in-person and remote access at the same time. So people really love the live opportunities to come in, but also it provides the flexibility to not have to um, say, you know, you're in, in Nain, for example, you wouldn't have to travel to Goose Bay to still take your, your classes. And for many of our learners, um, a lot of people already have professional full-time positions that they don't want to leave, but they want to pursue post-secondary education. So that gives even more flexibility there. And importantly, what that ensures is that we're not actually pulling people out of key leadership roles so that they can pursue their, their education, that they can actually do both. Um, yeah. One of the things that we're discussing now is, is actually how do you incorporate the technology access to the on-the-land programming? And what might that look like? Uh, and, and a number of younger people that, that we've been talking to have been talking about all different forms of, of the virtual world and virtual reality and kind of, you know, the, the, the metaverse and having, you know, VR goggles that take you on a polar bear hunt, for example, was a discussion I just had the other day. From, from start to finish, it would all be filmed and produced and then students could actually, you know, feel immersed and then talk to someone who who is a respected polar bear hunter and elder about it. And you can build a whole curriculum around that. Um, so, you know, the, one of the things that I'm most excited about is students have incredible ideas. And as we bring more and more people onto the campus, they will force us in a good way to change and evolve. And they will actually create those kind of the, the pathways that we haven't even envisioned. Um, so I think, again, like everything, these are where we're at right now with technology is just the start. It's it's like the baseline to get us going and where it will evolve, especially as technology is evolving, um, you know, globally, the uh, the where we're going to go. I don't even know if I 
I think I'm too old to foresee <laughs> where we're going technology-wise. At least that's what my 12-year-old tells me every day. <laughs> but, uh, my age stops me from seeing technology breakthroughs. <laughs> so. And and I see your question there. Again, this is so essential. Um, so internet, housing, absolutely, all of these things are so tricky. And one major limitation that we're facing right now is housing for students. Um, housing is, is a challenge everywhere in Labrador and, and most places in the north. Um, but because we don't have the ability to build our own campus yet, which the dream is to build brand new infrastructure here that would be indigenous design and indigenous focus and have um, community residences, is in the short term um, we're dealing with, with that and we're looking at creative partnerships um, with some, some potential opportunities here to open up space that would be specifically for students. Um, and the internet is a challenge. I mean, outside of, of Houston's Bay, it can be less stable. Um, and what is coming though in the next couple of years is uh, more broadband access, more cell service access throughout all of Labrador. Uh, and a lot of people are also getting the Starlink system right now, and that is rapidly increasing access. So we're hoping on the broadband side, we'll be in a better position um, quite soon. The housing thing is is enormous. That is a huge challenge that we're facing and trying to figure out what to do there. Um, and people are, I mean, this is like, we work with the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay on some of these things uh, and local organizations who are very interested in finding creative solutions to support students in the short term. Does anybody have anything further for Ashley or are we good? This has been fabulous, Ashley. I have to say, you know, in terms of um, uh, the learning about what's happening in our Northern campus and how it's developing for sure. It's, it's great insight. Thank you. Uh, Erica has another question there. Can you give a sense for what it's like for a student to go from Maine to have to live in Happy Valley Goose Bay? Yeah, and and actually, uh, Erica, if you don't mind, and and Catherine, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, um, it would be great to hear your reflections on this because this is something we also talked about a lot in our task force, but something that you experienced yourself, and that a lot of your your friends and and people that you know have gone through this. Sure, thanks, Ashley. Um, it's still. Um, I don't know what the actual kilometers are, but uh, the communities on the north coast of Labrador are still remote. There are no roads that um, that you can drive a vehicle. Um, you can drive a skidoo in the winter time, um, but of course that's dependent on ice conditions and snow conditions. Um, so it is still um, it still does mean travel. Um, from Nain, Natwashish, Hopedale, Mokovic, Postville, Rigolet into Goose Bay. Um, and <clears throat> there are some challenges um, that would still be present. And I know Ashley is fully aware of those and, and thinking about that as, you know, we're looking at a Labrador campus, um, there's a, you know, there, there isn't a great public transit system there. Um, so looking at residences next to the campus would be important, um, those types of things. Um, but Goose Bay has been the center for medical um, and other things for, for decades. So um, people are more comfortable and familiar with Goose Bay than they would be with St. John's, for example. Even the size and the population um, of the community is vastly different than coming to a place like St. John's. Um, plus, um, I one of the comments um, that you had in your in your presentation, Ashley, from Grand Chief Rich about having that support network 
of family and community is important. And that's something that Goose Bay can still provide, even though someone might not be from uh, Goose Bay, there are still family and community networks for many people in Goose Bay because a lot of people have moved to Goose Bay and there's a fairly large transient population because people are, you know, fairly consistently coming into Goose Bay for hospital and, and, and work-related travel. Um, so it's still, you, you know, I, I think we need to be realistic that it's there will still be some challenges for um, that we need to look at, um, but it, I mean, when I travel back to Labrador for work, I can get off the plane in Goose Bay and take in a big, you know, deep breath of Labrador air and feel like I'm home. So it still does have that sense of familiarity. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. And that's that's something that we have talked specifically to to younger people around that about what would it be like to transition to Goose Bay, and and all of those things that Catherine just talked about. It's still a challenge. It's still being away. But then so many students say, "Well, I know a ton of people in Goose Bay, or my older brother's there, or my aunt and uncle's there." And we've had a number of students say, "Well, at least if I went to Goose Bay and I was away from home, people would still sound and look like home." And so, you know, even if you're you're coming down from Nain or, or Hopedale, you still recognize people and you know people and, you know, people still are doing things on the land that you would do. So it might not be the land around your community, but the the behaviors and the seasonal patterns and the things that people really care about are are very similar. Jump in, Catherine. I just saw your, your hand go up. Yeah, I just put it up only for when you're done. Just one other thing. So when we were, when I did the consultations and engagement sessions for the strategic framework for indigenization, um, there was a student in one of the um, sessions that talked about um, the Aboriginal, what was the ARL, the Aboriginal Resource Office at the St. John's campus and how it was like a home away from home because they could go, once they walked into that space, People knew who they were, they could call them by their first name, and I can't tell you how much that means to people to be known and for people, you know, for people to know you and to be called by your first name. That happens all the time back home. And so that, you know, that one piece is still something that can happen in Goose Bay because you can walk down the road, you can walk into North Mart or, you know, the co-op or whatever store um and people someone will recognize you and and that is something that is really important i think for young well for a lot of people and for young people in particular too yeah absolutely to be seen and to be recognized and if they don't know you within 30 seconds of a conversation everyone will know who you're connected to <laughs> and so those are and and you feel a belonging um so students would talk about that but at the same time we are working um with uh well all three indigenous governments for students who would travel in to look at what are some specific uh supports that they would need even coming from from um you know a, a shorter distance from the coast to goose bay rather than leaving for a much larger center there's still going to be unique supports we need to think about for students Okay, I think that pretty, pretty much brings us to the end uh, of, of the time. There's still a couple of minutes if anybody wants to uh, have a quick question or comment. Okay, Ashley, thank you so much for this. It's uh, There's a lot of thank yous going to start floating up. Uh, great discussion. I think if everybody wants to unmute and give us a round of applause for actually uh, it's appropriate at the end of the conference for sure uh or share your emojis for sure it's been a great session yeah lots of applause there's no doubt thank you great thing thanks to so come much everyone and your leadership thank you for your leadership very important point on on and catherine for taking us here well, it's it's a work and labors of love of many, many, many people. So it's it's an honor to to do this work with so many incredible people. Yeah, 
I can't think of a better way to end the conference than talking about how Memorial is expanding its campus footprint in new territory in so many ways, the physical as well as, as the cultural and other ways to expand our teaching for change for sure. Well, that concludes. We're still here for a few minutes. Um, just uh, going to take an opportunity uh, to say, like, for my experience, so I'll bring myself back on screen if that's okay. Um, this will take us to the last few minutes or half hour. I hope a few people stick around because I uh, just wanted to have uh, invite myself and uh, my, my uh, co-chair, Christina Thorpe, Dr. Christina Thorpe as well, to just share in, in some conference reflections and everybody for the last few minutes. Uh, I can't tell you like the great day this has been for me again on the second day. I can't believe we're come to the final moments of um, of the conference for sure. It's been an exciting two days. There's no doubt. Uh, if anybody wants to give me an emoji to tell me how they're feeling now at this at this time and what they've been through, by all means, uh, share that uh, at this time is great. Um, so I'll just I'd like to share a few things like I think even here in Ashley, uh, Dr. Consolo's last plenary here, it really hit home to me for me, uh, one of my big takeaways from the conference, and that would be that. While we thought a lot about and talked a lot about teaching for change in so many ways, because our program was so rich in scope uh, on topics uh, on the theme. It has pretty much for me, or most of the sessions I've been in and out of, has been so student centric. You know, it's been focused on the student and importantly, all students, not just their education, but who they are as individuals and how we remove those barriers and how we um, how we create those opportunities for students to um, to find themselves in their own element in their learning, to use uh, Dr. Consolo's words, but to find their own element in their learning. And, uh, you know, the student voice is so important in doing that. And it's important in our event. And over the last couple of days, we've heard from participants and presenters of students themselves who shared with us, you know, um, sometimes in very difficult uh, ways of hearing it and but sharing with us how they feel in, in there and find themselves in our learning spaces you know that has really hit home to me I think as an educator myself and in, in the discipline of business but also working inside CITL you know I've watched the changes in our student population almost accelerate if I think about students I taught five years ago and students I'm teaching in the last year, even it's it's very different and how much that matters to our teaching and learning. I'm certainly aware. I don't know you, Christina. I'm certainly aware of my own vulnerabilities, you know, and I catch myself feeling more vulnerable as I teach and I teach more going forward. And you would think with experience that I would probably feel more confident at times more uh, experienced in my teaching. But I have to say these days, I'm almost feeling more vulnerable a lot of times. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing because it's it's for me, it's that place of rawness. I think my one of my colleagues used earlier today that allows me to kind of open up and have a freedom to uh, to grow myself in it. So I think that for me has been a big part of the conference and what I can take away from it. Uh, perhaps knocking me out of my own element, right? Um, I've learned so much about how instructors and faculty and staff and students and we're all embracing these large changes in our environment, you know, from the technology to creating the more inclusive environments. Everything from what you mentioned right at the get go, uh, Christine, about, you know, students just not knowing uh, when they come in the front door, you know, of the university, what it e even is all about and just having that talk with them, the talk, you know, uh, here you are, and this is what, what it's all about. And, you know, to that, how we break down barriers in our syllabus, like 
and you showed us in your keynote to, you know, making our our learning space is more inclusive by having us all tell our stories and 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 finding those ways of being more creative in our own learning and and having that opportunity to find ourselves there and integrating the different principles in curriculum and and the spaces that we learn in. I got to say I could go on and on and on. It's just been a tremendous couple of days for me. I got a lot to think about, reflect on myself. I know I've been on the back scenes too and and a lot of the organizing but it's it's events like this that you know i really yeah i really am awakened <laughs> i think to new things and and new ways of knowing about myself so i uh, i gotta thank everybody for that um christina i don't know i'll, I'll look at you this is our first faculty coach here uh, you know, your experience in this as well and your presence has been so amazing at this conference. I'd love to hear what you, how, what your thoughts are and what your kind of takeaways are as well. Sure. I think that um, <clears throat> for me, the main thing that I've come away from the conference in the last two days and, and even kind of just starting with being the, the faculty coach here is just community, right? Like it teaching, I think that's kind of come up a lot for me and thinking about how important the community side of it is, um, you know, in terms of just like planning the conference and feeling more like part of kind of the teaching community at MON and, you know, getting to meet some of the, the guest speakers, right? Like, and, you know, having an opportunity to kind of bring her into my community and have that relationship, I think has been fabulous. And, and it feels like it's come up a lot in the presentations that I've been at, you know, so like comments and in, in, in the chats and the Q and A's about like, oh, you know, it's a great idea. Maybe we should have a community of practice or people, the number of people that have just given out their email in the chats has been fabulous, right? I think people are, are excited to kind of have that like-minded community. And I think even when you think a bit about, um, you know, one of the themes that was coming up a lot was that feeling of being overwhelmed and and tired, but also really invigorated by it all and, and wanting to do more. And, you know, I think community kind of gets back into that a little bit that, you know, we don't, we're not all on our own, right? I mean, I, I talk with Kellyanne about like the research integrity and the, the research impacting Indigenous groups. Like I learned more in just that, you know, hour long session about, you know, some of the how research impacts um, indigenous people. And, you know, that was a fabulous session. And, you know, that's how we kind of learn some of these extra things is by, you know, kind of getting into that community and and our resources that we have on campus. You know, there's lots of, you know, CITL and student life and the Blunden Center and, you know, kind of that and. And then even just, you know, like you said, student centric, right? Bringing all of our students into our community so that they're, they're an equal part of it. And we're all kind of in this relationship together. And how do we make sure that everyone from the students and the staff and, and the outside community, and really importantly, the students that they all feel like they're an equal voice and an equal part of that. And, you know, a lot of the discussion about EDI, I just, I, I really, yeah, it's kind of cheesy, but I do. I feel like the strength of community and the teaching has just been really brought home for me in the past two days, which has been lovely. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. If anybody's got any thoughts, you know, feel free to poke them in the chat too. I see a lot of thank yous and that's awesome. Lots of takeaways. Yeah. And, and that's, that's our intention. That's how we uh set out to have the conference and and to bring our community together to share this way so that we do learn from each other but also to get energized again right it's been a long long road for the last couple of years but i think what we've really highlighted here is is the amount of change that has taken place and and you know how good it is in a lot of ways right how how, how inspiring it really can be so um, I hope everybody's kind of found that that piece of the conference that way. Um, one thing I'll just I'll ask Darcy because at the 
because we are coming to the end, if anybody does have any feedback at all and want to share it, of course, you know, we're, we, we, we will be sending everybody a kind of link to our, um, our survey chat, uh, as well. So, uh, we will have a feedback form that'll go out. And if anybody's got any ideas about our next conference, like this is our annual event now. So, you know, it can only grow from here. And, uh, you know, Christina, you've been a part of this year. It's it's changed it again. You know, the, the, the richness of this event can only grow. So if anybody's got ideas about what they want to do in 2023, by all means, give us some uh you know give us some words and and share that with us in that survey you can also email and uh tl conference uh to us uh, if anybody's interested in even participating in the event and the organizing of it in any way next year on the program committee reviewing proposals or being a session moderator we we welcome that as well uh, so I think that brings us pretty much to the end, uh, as, as sad as that may seem, but it's also warm for me and, and I feel warm and fuzzy on the inside. I know that's a little warm and fuzzy, but it is. I do. I, I will sit back this evening and, and uh, you know, feel like I've learned a lot and just kind of be, yeah, uh, probably feel in my element, hopefully. So I'll just share that, you know, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements now that we are at the end of the uh, of the conference. I'd like to thank the Office of the Provost and Vice President and Academic, of, uh, first of all, for supporting and funding this event. Uh, it's all it's very important. We wouldn't be able to do it, of course, without that kind of support from our our leadership and our office of the provost, vice president, academic. Um, there's our conference plan, uh, program planning committee that I mentioned. Christina, you, and also Ruth, Ruth Hickey, or CITL's Ruth Hickey, have uh, led that committee of you know faculty, students, and staff from across the university. So the program would have not been what it is without that kind of input and guidance from everybody. Uh, in the community. This is everybody's event, of course, CITL, we we lead the organization, but really our program is really developed uh, by us all. So that's that's been tremendous. And then that's our conference, of course, our con all of our speakers, keynote, plenary, concurrent pres presenters, and those who reviewed our proposals for presentations that we've all enjoyed over the last couple of days. And the, those who are moderating all of our sessions, a big thank you, um, because that commitment to making this run smoothly is, is, is it really does make for the experience at the end of the day. For our senior leadership remarks from uh, our provost and vice president of academic, Margaret Steele, as well as VP of Grenfell, Ian Sutherland, of course, Catherine Anderson this afternoon, thank you so much that you could be part of it. And we wouldn't look as good without marketing and communications, of course. This is the, these are the people who work with uh, Peggy Miller in our office, CITL, our marketing manager, to make uh, make the show look good. So thanks for that. And last and not least, but of course, I can't thank enough uh, the team with inside CITL. I get a little filled up when I think about our work and dedication over a year um, and all the people involved on the organizing committee. Uh, I, if there's one thing I've always learned about CITL is that everybody in here has an expertise and they just love to use their expertise and they take great pride in doing it and always want to do a great job. So um, it's a real um, privilege to work in this environment for sure. And of course, the support services that went into making the whole event. All of CITL is involved in some shape or form. So it's a real team effort. And, you know, Dolores mentioned this morning, Dr. Mullings, that a lot of people don't really know or have not known pre pandemic. I think our visibility is certainly raised, but all the the wealth of resources for just about any question that anybody would have about their teaching practice or 
teaching and learning can be answered inside CITL with the various uh, services. So we do hope that people do take advantage of that for sure. Uh, and so that brings us to the end. Uh, it's a wrap for again for this year. I hope everybody has a great summer and, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing you at the conference in 2023.